So hello everyone, uh, welcome back to your uh, COMP335 tutorial. Um, so today what we'll be looking at is, we'll be looking at um, a, a sort of uh, a review of uh, showing how, showing that a, a language is, is not regular uh, using the uh, pumping lemma and closure properties, closure properties. Then we're going to do a sort of quick review of, of grammars. And then I'm going to introduce context-free grammars, uh, which you haven't seen in the lecture yet, but um, which, which you're going to see tonight. So I, I thought we would, or we thought we would sort of give you a, a preview of uh, context-free grammars. Okay, so um, if you have a, a language uh, L and you have sort of an intuition that that language is uh, not regular. Um, how do you how do you sort of prove this? Uh, so there's two ways of doing this. You can either use the uh, the uh, pumping lemma, uh, or you can use uh, closure properties. And so the main reason why we're going through this again, even though you've already seen this, uh, is because it didn't seem like it was uh, sort of super understood in your uh, assignment two. Um, that was also probably due to the fact that you had a, a midterm right after. Um, so we, we thought it'd be, it'd be sort of good to go over it again. Okay, so um, uh, what is the, uh, the pumping lemma? So the pumping lemma is essentially uh, the following. So it tells us if we have a language L, which is infinite and regular, then we, we have some sort of uh, uh, conclusion or some sort of consequence uh, that follows. And, and so this consequence here is that uh, there must exist some uh, positive integer m, uh, which uh, we uh, know as the pumping uh, length. So we have some positive integer m, which we call the uh, pumping length such that for any, uh, for any string w in L, where w has length at least the pumping length, we can decompose this string w into three components x, y, z, uh, such that when you pump, so when you pump this, uh, this string uh, up or down using uh, a, a, an integer i, then you'll also get that this string w i uh, is in L. So that's essentially what the uh, the pumping lemma is telling you. It's telling you that uh, given sort of uh, this condition, then uh, for any integer i, w i, which is x, any number of y is z, this should also be in L. Okay. So the idea of the pumping lemma is uh, you use it to show that a language is not regular. And so a common mistake that we saw in, in, uh, in the assignment two is some people try to, to show that uh, a language was regular using the pumping lemma. And so you, you can essentially never, uh, never do this. Uh, you, you, to show that a, a language is regular, so to show that a language is regular, you either create an FA uh, that accepts it, a regular expression that denotes it, or a grammar G, a regular grammar G that generates it. Okay, those are the only ways of showing that a language is regular. Uh, the pumping lemma can only be used to show that it is uh, not regular. So, so how do we do this? So suppose we have a, a language uh, L uh, and we wanna show that, we wanna disprove the fact that L is uh, regular. Uh, how do we do this using the pumping lemma? Well, the first step here that actually isn't mentioned is you assume you assume that uh, L is in fact uh, regular for the sake of uh, deriving a certain uh, contradiction. So you assume that L is regular and you're also assuming uh, you sort of based on the, uh, the language, you can sort of tell that it is infinite. So if the language L is regular and infinite, then we can uh, use the pumping lemma to to, uh, to sort of disprove, in fact, that it is uh, regular. Um, so how do you do that? You need to uh, derive a contradiction. And to do that, you need to follow some, some very sort of uh, key uh, unavoidable steps. So the first step is you need to pick a, a string 
which you know is an L and which you know has length at least M. And you need to sort of uh, say in your argument that you're assuming that M is the pumping uh, length. Um, so you pick a string W, which has a length at least uh, M. And so uh, something uh, very crucial to notice is that you can never pick a string with a specific uh, a length. So you can never do something like W is equal to uh, a to the seven. Okay. So this is something that we saw in, in, in your assignment two, where you wanted to show that a prime uh, was uh, not regular. Some people chose to uh, pick a to the seven because they said that seven was a prime number, but your length here should be, uh, should be arbitrary. Okay. It shouldn't be a specific length. Okay, so you need to sort of make sure that your string has arbitrary length, uh, which is at least uh, M. Okay, so that's the first step. Then you can decompose your string W into three parts, uh, X, Y, Z, where you know that um, the length of X and Y together is at most M, and the length of, of Y is at least one. Okay, you don't, need to assume uh, anything about z because uh, uh, the pumping lemma itself uh, does not so nothing is assumed about the length of z uh, in your pumping uh, lemma okay and then the last thing you need to do is you need to pick a particular or a specific value so for instance you can pick uh, i equals zero or i equals two so you pick a specific value such that uh, wi, which is uh, an x followed by any sort of i number of y's and followed by a z. Uh, you need to pick an i such that this guy is uh, not in L. And this uh, will lead you to a uh, contradiction because according to the, the, the pumping lemma, if this were regular, then for any i, it would be in L. So the fact that for a particular i, uh, wi is not in L, that leads to a contradiction of the pumping lemma, which implies that uh, your initial assumption was incorrect. And so L is in fact uh, not regular. Okay, um, so this is essentially a, a refresher of what the pumping lemma tells us and how to use it. So now an actual uh, sort of uh, exercise. We wanna show uh, using the pumping lemma that the language uh, 0n, so uh, 0 n number of times, and then uh, 1 j number of times, uh, where the number of zeros or n is strictly greater than, so this now looks like an i, so the number of zeros n is strictly greater than, than, than j's, than, than 1, sorry. We want to show that that language is not regular uh, using the pumping lemma. Okay, so. Uh, how do we do this? Well, you sort of follow this very systematic kind of uh, procedure. So the first step in, in any pumping lemma is you assume for the sake of contradiction um, that L is regular. Okay. And we see, in fact, that uh, the strings in, in, in this guy uh, L Essentially, they never finish. There's, there's not an end to the strings in L. So we also know that L is going to be uh, infinite. Okay, so we have this assumption and now we can use the uh, pumping lemma to break or to, to sort of derive a uh, contradiction. Okay, so uh, how do we do that? Well, the second step is we need to pick a W in L. Uh, such that the length of W is at least M. And here we're assuming that M is the pumping uh, length. Okay, so what could we, uh, what could we pick for uh, our, our string uh, W? Well, we know that we need to have a length at least uh, M, okay? And we know that for W to be an L, it has to have more zeros than, than ones. 
So W is, is probably, well, it's definitely going to look like some, some number of zeros followed by some number of, of ones. And now uh, a good pick here for, for W uh, would be uh, M plus one zeros and M uh, ones, okay? Um, so this, this sort of respects the strings that are in L because you have uh, more zeros than you do uh, uh, ones, okay? Uh, because you have M plus one zeros, which is strictly greater than M. But uh, this guy is not too big, so it's not too greater than the number of ones, so that if uh, the idea is, in this case, if you pump down, so if you try to remove zeros from, from uh, W, then you're going to get uh, a contradiction, okay? So that's the sort of uh, um, intuition be behind why you would pick something like a zero M plus one and one M, okay? But that's, that's, that's essentially a, a possible pick for W. So now what's the, uh, the sort of next step? The next step is to decompose uh, W into X, Y, Z, okay? So uh, how do we do this? Well, we know that W looks like, so W looks like a bunch of zeros and then a bunch of ones, okay? And namely we have, uh, we have M plus one zeros and we have uh, M ones, okay? So uh, next, we, we know that uh, the, the sort of X, Y, the strings X and Y are within the first M symbols of W. So that means that X, Y here is going to be uh, somewhere here. Okay, so it's going to be within the zeros for sure. Okay, and now we can use our, the second assumption of the pumping lemma, which says that the length of y is at least one. And so we know that uh, the, y, the, y's, the y is also going to be uh, within the zeros because you have x, y being uh, any number of zeros. So if you have a substring of that, you're also going to have um, sort of any number of, of zeros. So you could say that your y is maybe somewhere uh, here, okay? So uh, what, what this sort of implies, this implies that uh, Y looks like uh, uh, zeros, uh, K, K consecutive zeros, where we know that K has to be, uh, because of this assumption, K has to be uh, at least uh, one, okay? So we, know, we sort of know this from uh, this third step, okay? And now we're going to use that to our advantage in picking an I that's going to uh, break the pumping lemma, essentially, okay? So uh, step four here is we need to pick, pick uh, an I uh, such that WI, which is X, uh, Y, uh, I number of times, and then Z. So this guy, we need to pick an I such that this guy is not in L. So uh, what you need to sort of notice here is uh, for WI to not be an L, uh, the number of zeros here, so N here, uh, should be uh, sort of less than, so N should be less than or equal to J. So you should have um, as many zeros as ones or uh, less zeros than you do have ones, okay? And so how do we do this? How do we, uh, from so how do we, from, from this guy, remove zeros so that uh, your resulting WI has uh, less zeros than it does ones, or the same number? So to do that, because you need to sort of remove, the idea is you need to pump, uh, we say pump down, okay? And yeah, exactly. So to pump down, that would mean that you need to pick an I uh, as, as zero. Okay, so here you pick I as zero, and this you're going to see is going to give you a string that's not in L. So now we know, well, we know that uh, W zero looks like X, Y zero, uh, Z. 
But we know that y0 is just lambda, so we just get x uh, z. Okay? Uh, and we also know that the original string w1 is x y uh, z. So if you want to sort of compare, if you want to compare uh, this string to this string, Okay, the only difference is that w0, the string w0, has uh, k less, so it has k less zeros than w1 does. And the reason for that is because you're removing, you're removing y from w1, so you're removing k zeros from w1. Okay, so that means that uh, w0, which is going to be xz, is going to have a certain number of zeros. So in fact, what it's going to have, it's going to have the m plus one zeros, but then you're going to take away uh, the zeros in y. So there are k zeros in y, so you're going to take away k. And you're going to have uh, an unchanged number of ones, so you're going to have one to the m, okay? And so the last thing that you need to notice here is you need to notice that m plus one minus k uh, this guy, so you know that k, we know that k is at least 1. So from m plus 1, we're going to remove at least 1. So that means that uh, m plus 1 minus k is going to be at most m. Okay? And that means that uh, the number of zeros is at most the same as the number of 1s. Uh, this does not respect the definition here of L. Okay, so this this implies so this implies that w zero is not in L. This is a contradiction, uh, and so the contradiction implies that our initial assumption was uh, incorrect, and so that L is not regular. Okay, um, yes. Yeah, so m plus one minus k. Uh, is at most uh, m, okay? And so this shows that L is not uh, regular, okay? So uh, I hope that's that's clear. Uh, everyone seems uh, quiet today, but that's, that's okay. Um, so the next exercise here is uh, similar to the one where you had a uh, and then a prime number, but in this case, you have uh, a to the, uh, to the uh, cubic. So you have a cubic number of, of a's, okay? So uh, what is this going to, uh, what is this going to look like? Uh, what is L going to look like? Well, L is going to have uh, a sort of uh, one cube. So uh, that's just going to be a one. Then it's going to be a two cube. That's going to be eight. And a three cube, that's going to be 27 and sort of so on, okay? And those are going to be the, the sort of strings in, in L. And uh, sort of at face value, you can kind of tell that it would be difficult for, for an FA to accept such a language. And so we can sort of claim that it is not regular and prove this claim using the uh, pumping lemma. Okay, so how do we do this? Again, uh, you sort of use this uh, procedural way of, of going about going about it. The first thing you do is you assume, for the sake of contradiction, uh, that L is uh, regular, okay? And we see here that uh, sort of the, the strings in L never finish. So we know that L is regular, and we also know that it is uh, infinite, okay? So now we can essentially use the pumping lemma condition to try to break this assumption. So, so what do we do for the second step? We need to pick a, a W in L such that the length of W is at least M. So again, we're assuming that M uh, is the pumping is the pumping length. Okay. Um, so here and sort of in most cases where you have A to the something. The best pick for, for that kind of uh, a pumping lemma uh, exercise is just saying A uh, is picking W 
as a to that to that essentially that expression. So for instance, uh, in this case, I'm going to pick a to the m cube. But if instead of uh, k cube, I had something like a three to k, then a good pick would have been three to the m. Okay, and you're going to search. You're going to see essentially why uh, that's the case when I pick my i. Okay, but now I've picked my w uh, a to the m cube. Um, and so what I need to verify though, I need to verify that the length of W is at least M. Well, in this case, the length of W is exactly M cubed. Uh, and we know that uh, for any sort of, uh, for any uh, integer M, where M is at least uh, zero, M cube is going to be uh, at least uh, M. So it's going to be greater or equal to M. Okay, and so you to sort of convince yourself, you could sort of use an induction argument, but I'm going to skip that, and we can sort of just assume that for the uh, the sake of this this argument. Okay, so this is the W I've picked, and now I have to uh, essentially decompose it and then try to find a a pump so that the pumping the pumped string is no longer in L. So the step three is I need to decompose W into X, Y, Z. But now this is actually quite simple because we know that W is just a bunch of A's, okay? Uh, we know that within the uh, first M A's, we have uh, X, Y. So we know that X, Y is at most M, okay? And we know that within those, within that X, Y, uh, the y has to have length at least one. So your y, which is going to be somewhere here, uh, is going to have at least, uh, it's going to have length at least one. So this implies that y looks like uh, a to the k, okay? And because the length of y is at least one, we know that k has to be at least one. But something that's going to be useful in this proof is also to notice that the length of y is going to be at most m, okay? And the reason for that, the reason why uh, the length of y is at most m is because if it wasn't, then xy would have length. So this is, maybe this is not, xy would have length greater than m, which would break an assumption of the pumping lemma. And so this wouldn't be a contradiction yet, uh, you need to get through all the steps to get to a contradiction. So if you had said that K was uh, even greater than M, then that would have been an incorrect application of, of this assumption here. Okay, so what we know essentially is that Y is a K uh, is a K number of times where that K is between one and M. So that's what we can tell from step three. So now for step uh, four, we need to pick uh, an i such that wi, which is x, y, i, z, uh, is not in L, okay? So we need to pick a particular value. So it can be zero, two, three, and, and so on, okay? And in these types of examples, uh, in fact, the best or sort of the easiest pick uh, where you have a singleton alphabet and sort of some uh, weird expression in the exponent is going to be i equals uh, two, okay? And it's going to be clear why when I, when I sort of show uh, what the length of w2 is, okay? So I'm going to pick i equals two. And so that would mean that if w1 is uh, x, y, z, then w2 is x, y, y, uh, z. So essentially what you're doing is um, from the m cube a's, you're going to add k a's to that because you're adding, you're adding an extra y. So you're going to add k a's to your w2. So we're going to get plus k, okay? That's going to be your w2. So now what you need to do is, so now your new goal here, your goal, is to show that W2 is not in L, okay? 
And this is true if and only if m cubed plus k does not equal something cubed, basically. So it doesn't look like a cubic number. Okay. So how do I do this? How do I, how do I prove that this is true? Well, one way to show that m cubed plus k is not uh, a number cubed is by showing that it is uh, strictly greater than uh, m cubed and strictly less than the consecutive uh, cubic number, which would be uh, m plus one uh, cubed. Okay. The reason why this shows that uh, this is true is because if you have a number, let's say, uh, let's just say this is x. If you have a number x, which is between two consecutive cubic numbers and is not equal to either consecutive cubic numbers, then it can't be any other sort of cubic because it has, it has essentially no room. It has no place to get that other uh, cubic number from. And so the same, the same argument would apply if this was uh, sort of factorial or two to the k or something like that. Okay. Um, so now we need to show this basically. So how do we do that? Well, we start with m cubed. And we, we know that k is at least one. So what we're going to have is uh, if we have m cubed and we add k to it, so we're adding uh, k to m cubed, we're adding at least one to it. So that would mean that m cubed plus k is strictly greater than m cubed, okay? And then we need to use this assumption here. That's why I wrote it down in this case. So we use the fact that m cubed plus k is strictly less than, uh, is less than or equal, sorry, to m cubed plus m, okay? And now what we need to show is we need to show that this is somehow uh, strictly less than m plus one cubed, uh, but it's very easy to notice that, for instance, m cubed plus m is strictly less than m cubed plus m plus one, right? Because you're adding one to it, so for sure it's going to be, uh, strictly greater than it. And then this is going to be uh, sort of less than or equal to m cubed plus uh, 3m squared plus you add essentially 3m squared and then 2m to this guy. So you add 2m to this guy, so you get 3m uh, plus 1. Okay, and so this, this gives you that m cubed plus three, so m cubed plus three m squared plus three m plus one, that's in fact equal to m plus one cubed. And so we see that m cubed plus k is strictly less than m plus one cubed and strictly greater than uh, m cubed, okay? So this, this implies that, uh, what does this imply? This implies that w2 uh, is not in L because the power of W2 is not a cubic number, uh, which is a contradiction. So that means that uh, this assumption was incorrect. Uh, and because that assumption was incorrect, we get the conclusion that L is not uh, regular. Um, okay, so question. Um, if you have AK where, um, yeah, so as, as Ragnar said, um, you're not claiming that the length of y is at least one. You're uh, sorry, you're not claiming that it's exactly one. You're claiming that it's at least one, okay? Uh, so that's a very sort of important uh, distinction to make because if the length was exactly one, this would not be uh, the pumping lemma and then you couldn't essentially apply it basically, okay? Um, so that's the sort of review for the, the pumping. Um, yeah, I, I, I could do that again, if you want me to. So, um, uh, so essentially we wanna show that uh, m cubed plus k is uh, strictly greater than m cubed and strictly less than m plus one cubed, okay? So uh, hopefully the left-hand side here, that's sort of clear enough because uh, if you add k to m cubed, you're adding at least one to m cubed. So if you have m cubed plus at least one, that's for sure going to be, uh, so that's for sure going to be strictly greater than m cubed. Because like if, if, you have, uh, if you have x 
and you add one to x, that's definitely greater than, strictly greater than x. Okay, that's sort of, that's the case for, for in fact, for any x in, in the real numbers. So it, it holds for the integers as well. Okay, the other part, which is maybe a bit more tricky, is, is sort of this direction here, or this, uh, this side. So what you need to, what you need to notice uh, is you need to notice that k is at most m, right? So it's, it, it can be at most equal to m. So for sure, if you have m cubed plus k, so you have m cubed plus k here, then that's going to be at most uh, equal to m cubed plus m, because that would happen if, for instance, in the worst case, uh, k was equal to m. So k was sort of equal to m in the sort of worst case. That's like worst case scenario. m q plus k is equal to m q plus m. But in general, m q plus a is at most, is at most m q plus m. Okay. Um, so, so now I'm here, right? Uh, so again, what I want to show is I want to show that this is strictly less than uh, m plus one cube. And I know that m plus one cube is m cube plus three m squared plus three m plus one. So what I can do is I can sort of use this, this uh, basic argument where uh, if I have, I essentially use uh, this argument here, but sort of in the other sort of direction. So if I have x, so imagine this is x, uh, and I add one to it, so I add one to it, then x is definitely going to be strictly less than x plus one, okay? So I have from, from this from this guy to this guy a strict inequality. So this already implies that, uh, so this is getting very messy, this already implies that m cubed plus k is strictly less than m cubed plus m plus one, okay? And so now what I can do is I can essentially add, I can add all of my other terms for free to get m plus one q. So what I do is from m q plus m plus one, I add, let's say three m square. So I get, uh, I get that this is at most plus three m square. And then I add another two m. So I get a three m here. So I get that m q plus three m square plus three m plus one is greater than or equal to this guy, which is strictly greater than this guy. So this implies that uh, m plus one q which is just this, is strictly greater than, um, than this, okay? Um, so I hope uh, it's, it's clear uh, sort of that time around, okay? So that, um, it, if it's not, then maybe talk to me uh, sort of after the tutorial. Um, so that concludes essentially the review on uh, the pumping lemma. So now, Another way to, to show that a language L is uh, not regular is by using the, uh, the closure property. So what you can do is you, again, assume for the sake of contradiction that L is regular, and then you combine it, you combine it, so you combine it using a union, an intersection, a difference, and so on, with uh, another regular language. And you know that these regular languages are closed so regular languages are, for instance, closed under the union. So when you combine, so when you combine L and some other language, uh, you preserve the regularity. So you keep the same sort of, you keep a language being regular. But then the goal of this kind of proof is that this should lead to uh, the conclusion that the resulting la, sort of the resulting language from the combination of L and some other regular language, uh, L prime is regular, even though we know that L prime is not regular. So for instance, you can get L, which you wanna show is uh, not regular, you assume it's regular, and then you union it with, let's say L1, which you know is regular, and this somehow gives you A N B N, okay? Uh, and then the conclusion would be that this guy is regular. But this is a contradiction, because you know that A N B N is not regular, Okay, and so that would mean that the assumption that L is regular is false and that uh, L is in fact not regular. So that, that's sort of the, the basic overview, but now uh, some examples to make it more concrete. 
So uh, I have the following language, uh, ANBN, but now it's different from the typical ANBN. We know that in this case, N is at least 335. And we want to prove that this guy is not regular. So how do we do this? Well, again, for, for sort of um, the sake of contradiction, we assume that L is, uh, is regular. Okay, um, so we have that, that L is regular. And now we pick uh, another language. In this case, we pick the language L1, which is going to be ANBN for N at most 335. So in this case, L1 is going to look like lambda, A, B, and so on until A334, B334. Okay, so we know that L1 is finite. L1 is finite because it has a finite number of, of strings, which makes it uh, regular. So L1 is regular, okay? And what we're going to do is we're going to take uh, L1, which we assumed is regular, uh, I'm sorry, which we know is regular, and union it with L, which we assumed, so we assumed here that that was regular, and we're going to get uh, A and B N, right? We get A and B N because we get from lambda to A334, B334, and then with uh, the L here, with the L here, we get A335 uh, to sort of infinity. So L union L1 gives us A, N, B, N. But notice we assume that L is regular and we know that L1 is regular. So the union of L union, uh, the union of L and L1, because they're both regular, should give a regular language. Okay? So that would mean that A, N, B, N. Uh, is uh, regular. But this is clearly a contradiction because we've already shown, and it has been shown to you in the lecture slides, that ANBN is not regular. So this is a contradiction, and this, uh, this contradiction leads you to, to sort of say that your initial assumption one, where you assume that L is regular, is incorrect, and in fact, L must be not uh, regular. Okay? So that's one example of using closure properties and sort of contradiction to show that L is uh, not regular. Another example here, uh, which is a bit slightly more uh, sort of complicated, I have the language uh, L, which is uh, any string W1 followed by some symbol C, and then any string W2, where the string W1 is different. So it does not look like the string W2. Does, is this language L regular? Well, you can sort of intuitively think that it would be very difficult for an FA to kind of uh, keep track of W1 and W2. It would require some memory. So um, we can claim that L is not regular. And now we can prove this using, in fact, both the closure properties and the pumping lemma. So how do we do this? Well, again, like any, any kind of non-regular uh, proof, we assume for the sake of contradiction that uh, L is regular, okay? So uh, if, if L is regular, right, that means that it's complement, so the complement of L, because regular languages are closed under the, the sort of complement, uh, this L complement is going to be regular. And what you need to notice is L complement is going to contain, so L complement is going to contain strings that look like W1, C, uh, W2, where W1 is equal to W2, and then union some other strings. So it's going to contain, it's going to definitely contain something like this because you're just negating this guy, and it's going to contain other things, okay? But we don't really care about the other things because what we're going to do now is we're going to take L complement and we're going to intersect it with uh, A star C A star. So the intersection we know is going to look like uh, some, some A's. So let's say M A's C and then uh, N A's, right? Because it has to have this form. But because we're intersecting it with L complement, we know that uh, the on the left of C, the left string of C, the string on the left of C has to be the same as the string of the right of C. So in this case, this means that the number of A's on the left of C has to be 
the same as the number of a's on the right of c. So that means that the intersection we get is uh, a n c a n. Okay, and because the intersection is closed under, because regular languages are closed under the intersection, this guy l prime, which is a n c a n, must be regular. But now we can sort of easily use a, a pumping lemma uh, argument. We can use a pumping lemma argument to show that L prime is not regular. So I'm not going to go through this in detail. But if, for instance, you pick AM, C, A, M, and then you either pump up or down, then you're going to get a different number of A's on the left than uh, A's on, on the right. And so that's going to give you a string that is not in L prime, which is going to be a contradiction of the pumping lemma. So you get a contradiction, which means your initial assumption was incorrect. And in fact, L is not regular. Okay. And then one last example here uh, with uh, closure properties is uh, we have the language L that looks like uh, any string uh, sort of W over, so this would be zero one star, okay? Where W has, uh, w has more zeros than it does ones. And we wanna use the closure properties uh, to show that L is not regular, okay? So um, what you need to sort of uh, think about in, in, this, in this case is uh, you need to think of our previous example where we had uh, zero N one, uh, k, where n was strictly greater than k, greater or equal to zero. So we've already proved using the pumping lemma that this guy is non-regular. So I, I hope that you can kind of see that using the uh, a combination with another regular language, uh, you, can, you can sort of get a, a contradiction intersecting with sort of L. Okay, so, so what do I mean by this? Well, so again, assume uh, assume for the sake of contradiction that uh, L is regular, okay? Now we're going to take L and we're going to intersect it with L uh, zero star uh, one star. So what is my language going to look like? Uh, it's going to look like uh, any number of zeros, okay? Followed by any number of ones. So maybe let me use K. Let me use N and K. Any number of zeros followed by any number of ones, where we know that the number of, of zeros is strictly greater than the number of ones. And we know that because we're intersecting it with L. So all of the strings in, in this guy are going to be both in this guy and this guy. And strings that are in this guy have more zeros than they do ones. Okay. So what happens basically is we assume that L is regular. And we know that L zero star one star is regular. So the intersection of two regular languages is regular. So now we get that this language here uh, is regular, but this is clearly a contradiction. Uh, this is a uh, contradiction, okay? So what that means is that our initial assumption was incorrect. And in fact, L is uh, not uh, regular, okay? Um, and, and so that shows uh, um, the proof for, for sort of this exercise. So uh, I, I, hope, I hope that's, that's uh, clear for, for now. That sort of ends the sort of overview on uh, showing how, how to show that a language is regular. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we went through this in the tutorial because uh, as I said before, it wasn't uh, sort of done very, very successfully in the assignment. But hopefully now that you have uh, an idea, uh, when the professor introduces uh, the second sort of pumping lemma, you get a, a better idea of, of how, to, how to use it, okay? Uh, and again, uh, you, can, you can always stop me and, and ask me questions, but if there are no questions, I'm going to uh, keep going. So um, now a, a, a quick sort of review of, of, uh, of grammars. So in this review section, we essentially have some grammars and we want to know which strings are generated by, by G. Because we already did a lot of these in uh, sort of last week, I'm not going to go through all of them. I'm just going to pick uh, sort of a few. 
So I, I have the following grammar uh, G with the following set of production rules, and I want to know which of the following strings are generated by G. So let's do A and B, and I'll leave C and D sort of as, a, as an exercise. Um, uh, so is A, A, B, so is three A's followed by B generated by G? Well, you can sort of easily sort of check this by starting an S, as you always do. And so now what you need to notice is if you're an S, uh, then to get an A, you can either get an A with, with S and come back to S, or get an A with A. But you don't really want to do that immediately because once you're an A, then it sort of gets tricky. You can either see a B or, or a capital B, and sort of it, it gets a bit uh, uh, less straightforward. So the most straightforward derivation is if you start an S, then you give yourself an A and you stay an S, and you give yourself another A and you stay an S. And then once you're at two A's, now you can use this production rule because, you, because once you have the before last uh, symbol, which is A, you, 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 switch to, to, you switch to capital A because then you can get your B here. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to replace the S with uh, little a capital A, and then I'm going to replace capital A with. Um, I'm going to use capital A gives me capital B. So oh no, actually I'm going to use. Uh, I want to get a B here, so I'm going to use a a a b a. Okay, and then now what I'm going to do is I want to get this lambda here because I want to stop this process. So uh, from a, I'm going to go to b. And then from B, I'm going to use a lambda, which just gives me my string A, 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 B. So A is in fact in the grammar. So this belongs to L of G. Okay, uh, let's, let's, do, let's try to do B, uh, B uh, quite quickly. So is B, A, B generated by the uh, grammar G? Uh, well, you're, you, you always need to start in S. And now what you need to notice is you can't use this one or this one because you want to start with a B. So if you want to start with a B, you need to, you need to use uh, this guy. So you start with a B and now you go to A. So now that you're in A, uh, you don't want to use B A because then you would get another B. And in fact, you want an A. So what you do is you go to B. So you go to B and then from B, well, I don't want to stop. So I don't want to stop my process. I don't want to get another B. So what I do is I, I, get, I get an A, by staying back by staying in B. So I get a B, A, and then a B. And then uh, I have no choice. If I wanna, if I wanna get a B, I have to go back to S. So I get a B, A, and then a B, S. But now I realize that I'm stuck because once I'm in S, all of these production rules give me terminals. And so we see that uh, this derivation, uh, which is sort of the exhaustive search of the, the the correct derivation is not going to give you, so this is not going to give you BAB. Uh, and we see that in fact, uh, BAB is not going to be in the language generated by G. Uh, so that's why we would cross that, that uh, example. Okay, so for C and D, I'll, I'll leave that uh, for you if, if you want to try it um, on your own time. Okay, uh, another example here, which is a similar concept. This is basically just to get you warmed up for, for seeing grammars again. Um, is we, we again have these production rules and we want to know uh, what strings are uh, generated by, by this grammar. So what we need to notice here to sort of uh, quickly eliminate some, some strings from our, uh, from our list here is we notice that all of the grammar, the grammars here have production rules that are uh, right linear. So all of these are right linear. And the only production rule that, that gives you only terminals is BB. So what that means is any string W in L of G, so in the, in the language generated by G, uh, is going to look like W, a bunch of, of symbols, and then BB. Okay, so uh, the string needs to end in BB. Okay. So that means that we can already cross this guy off, cross this guy off, and cross this guy off. So the last thing you need to do is to check uh, C. Is uh, B, A, B, B generated by, by G? Well, you can do that quite quickly, actually. So you start an S. And so if you're an S, you don't want to get an A, B. 
Instead, what you do is you get an A, okay? And then from A, it's, it's quite convenient. You have a BA and then a B. So you replace that with BA and then a B because you want this guy. And so now you're in B, and now you want to end your string with this BB, and you can easily do that with using the production rule BB. So then you get a BA, BB, and uh, this shows that C is in fact in the language generated by G. Okay, so this was a very, very sort of fast refresher to sort of remind you how grammars work and how they generate uh, strings. So now that hopefully you sort of uh, warmed up to the idea of, of grammars, I'm going to introduce uh, the notion of uh, context-free grammars, which is something that you haven't seen in the lecture yet, but you'll see tonight. But it's essentially just a couple of examples to get you uh, warmed up to the idea. Okay, so, uh, so far, uh, the grammars that we've sort of uh, qualified have been, so the grammars that we've qualified and studied are uh, grammars G that are regular. There is a sort of more powerful uh, grammar, a more uh, sort of a grammar that gives you more uh, languages, which is known as the context-free grammar. And so what does this context-free grammar look like? Well, we have a definition here. So um, the context-free grammar G is, again, like a grammar, it's a four-tuple of a set of variables, a set of terminals, a start variable, and a set of production rules. But now, very differently from uh, regular grammars or right linear, left linear grammars, the production rules P have the form, so all of the production rules P have the form a single variable on the left hand side, and on the right hand side, you can essentially do anything. So on the right hand side, you have X, and X can be any. Uh, arrangement and any order of variables and terminals in sort of any any order you would like okay so uh, what are some production rules that you could see in a context-free grammar well you could definitely see something like uh, this because on the left hand side you have a single variable and in fact on the right hand side you have a uh, right linear productions so um, in this case, you have some terminal and then a variable. So this respects the fact that uh, X or the right-hand side is any combination in any order of T of uh, terminals and variables. So um, this would be part, this could be part of a context-free grammar G. Something that, that you would not see, however, in a right or left linear grammar, which you would see in a context-free grammar, is a production rule that looks like this. So S could give you, uh, in this case, uh, a variable A, and then at each of its sides, uh, a, a terminal A, uh, which is not something you would see in a right or left linear grammar. Or you could also see uh, more than one uh, variable. So you could see AS. You could also see something like ABC, where there aren't even uh, any uh, well, in this case, I assume that the variables were A and S. So you could see uh, three variables and no terminals. That would also be fine. And of course, you could see something like uh, only terminals. Okay. So essentially, this, this opens up a lot of possibility for what the production rules in uh, CFGs look like. The only thing that you can't do, so this could be in G. This could be a production rule in G. The only thing that you can't do is have more than a single variable on the left-hand side. So uh, this A, this uh, terminal A, S terminal A, this would not be part of a context-free grammar G. This is something that you would see in a context-sensitive uh, grammar, which uh, we're going to discuss at the very end of, of the course, which is even more powerful than context-free uh, grammars. Okay, so um, we, we can already see actually that uh, if you have a regular grammar G, then this regular grammar uh, is also actually, so it, it's sort of like, you can very loosely think of as, as belonging to a context-free grammar G. So we know that context-free grammars are as powerful as regular grammars, 
but they are actually more powerful because they can generate uh, they can generate languages that uh, are not uh, poss are, can't be generated by regular grammars. Okay, so in other words, context-free grammars can generate grammars that can't be can generate languages. Sorry, uh, CFGs can generate languages that aren't regular. Essentially, one of those examples is actually the following. So we have the following uh, context-free grammar G here, where we have that. Uh, S gives you S and then on either side terminal A, on either side terminal B, uh, or uh, the empty string, okay? And so if you want to sort of try to, to see what the uh, strings generated by, by G are, well, um, if you sort of, let, sort of this, is, this is sort of, if you want to do it uh, by shortest to longest string, but if you just notice a pattern here where uh, if you start an S, then you can replace it by, for instance, S uh, A S A, and then maybe you replace that by A B S B A, and then maybe you replace that by uh, you replace S by B S B S, okay, and sort of so on. You're going to get at the end, you're going to get a a string W that looks like uh, A B A. So if it starts with A B B, sorry, I said A B A, but I meant A B B. If it starts with A B B, then it's going to end. It's going to end from right to left with A B B, and then it's going to essentially have the matching symbols at each extremity uh, until you sort of go to the middle. Okay, and so what you can actually notice is your string W, the string W that is in the language generated by G, is going to have um, sort of the same symbols at both uh, extremities. So it's going to have uh, the symbol A1 at the leftmost extremity and the symbol A1 at the rightmost extremity. And the same thing for the second leftmost and the second rightmost symbol, they're going to be the same. And so what you're going to notice actually is if you take W, which looks like A1, A2, uh, A2, A1, and then you reverse it, so you reverse this guy, you're actually going to get again A1, A2, and so on, A2, A1. So really you're going to just get your initial string, okay? And strings where the reversal of that string is the same as the initial string are called palindromes, okay? And in this sort of particular case, these are going to be palindromes of uh, even length, uh, and that's because the production rule here of terminal is a lambda, okay? So if you had, for instance, A or B, it would be a bit different. It wouldn't be of even length. It would be an, of odd length. And that's because if you sort of think of W as A1, A1, A2, A2, and you sort of keep deriving it, right? Then at some point, you're going to get an S. And then once you stop, your S is going to be a lambda. So then on the left side of your lambda, you're going to have uh, N symbols. And then on the right side of your lambda, you're going to have N symbols. So the length of W is going to be 2N, which is even. So that's why you get uh, even length uh, palindromes. Okay. Um, okay. And so for the last exercise of this tutorial, uh, we want to write a grammar that generates the language uh, the following language. Um, so, do, it's almost 5.15, so don't think I have time to give you, I don't think I have sort of time to, to uh, sort of allow you to, to, to think about the solution. So I think I'll just um, go through it myself. Um, but um, maybe, maybe take, take a, a couple of seconds just to, to look at, at the strings that are in L. Um, and then I'll, I'll quickly sort of show you how to do it. Okay, so um, that was literally like 10 seconds, so I'm sure you had almost no time to think about anything, but let's try to find a grammar that, um, that would generate this language. So we want a grammar, so it doesn't say that the grammar is context-free or not,
but we can see that this guy L is uh, not uh, regular. L is not regular. So that means that for sure there isn't, so there does not exist a regular, a regular grammar, so regular grammar G uh, such that L of G is equal to L. Okay. So that means that we're actually forced to try to find a, a context free grammar, so a context free grammar G such that the language generated by G is L. So we're sort of forced, we have no choice to use uh, the context free uh, sort of concept. Um, and so this might seem very, very abstract to you since you haven't actually seen uh, any examples like this before. But um, if we sort of decompose or, or decompose the, the string in L uh, into pieces, it's going to become hopefully a bit clearer how to get a context-free grammar G. So we know that we have, first of all, NAs. So we have uh, NAs. And then we have B N plus K plus one. So that means that we have N Bs. So we have N Bs. We have N Bs. And then we have a, a one. So I'm gonna put a one B here. And then we have K more Bs. So we have K more Bs here. And then we have K Cs here, okay? KCs here. So really what this part of the language looks like, this looks like AN, uh, BN. Okay. But we already know how to, well, we, we sort of know how to write a grammar that looks like AN, BN. So I'm going to remind you, uh, it looks like, for instance, because I don't want to use the start, start, start variable S, I'm going to use A. So to get AN, BN, what you do is uh, if you see an A, you give yourself the same number of, of Bs. So if you see an A, for each A, you get a B. And then you can repeat that process with having a variable A in between. Or you can terminate with a lambda. Okay. And you essentially repeat the same process for this guy. This guy really looks like a BKCK. So this would look like, for instance, if I use the variable B, uh, if I use the variable B, then um, for every B I see, I get the, the same number of C. So for every B, I have a C. Uh, wow, that, that was quick. Yes. Uh, so for every B, I have a C, and then I can repeat that process with a B in between. Or I can terminate with a uh, lambda. So this is going to give me uh, the same number of Bs as Cs, and this is going to give me the same number of As as Bs. So the last thing I need to do is I need to sort of tie uh, this guy with this guy and not forget that there's a B in the middle. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, so suppose my grammar G is uh, S, A, B, and then terminals A, B, uh, start variable S and production rules P, where P, so I'm going to start at S and then I can essentially uh, for each variable, I'm going to allow it to branch off to do either this case or this case. Um, so what I'm going to do is I know that I'm always going to have a B here because there's a one here. So I, my string is at least going to have a B. So I know that I'm going to have at least a B here. Uh, and then on the left of this terminal B, I'm going to have uh, A, N, B, N. So I'm going to just give myself A because A is what's going to generate um, A and B N. And then on the right of terminal B, I'm going to give myself a variable B, which is going to give me this, uh, sorry, B, K, uh, C, K. Okay. And then I just rewrite A as A, A, B, lambda, and B as uh, B, B, C, lambda. So yes, very good, Ryan. This, this is in fact, a grammar, a context-free grammar, uh, such that L of G uh, is equal to um, L. And uh, I think that, yeah, so that, that finishes the, uh, the uh, tutorial. Um, everyone has been 